Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Inside Housing webinar on affordable credit. My name is Nick Duxbury. I'm the executive editor at Inside Housing, and I'm going to be chairing this event. We've got a fantastic lineup of speakers for you this afternoon, but before I introduce them, a little bit of background for you. Inside Housing is laying on this event in partnership with the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, which last week uh, launched a, a report examining what housing associations are doing to help their tenants access affordable credit, and most importantly, how effective these schemes are proving to be. As well as success stories, the research brought to light a series of challenges, such as low take-up um, and uh, uh, various other things, including engagement and the extent to which uh, housing associations are having sort of good relationships with credit unions. Um, a lot, all of this needs to be overcome if housing providers are to successfully support tenants to access genuinely affordable credit. Post-Brexit, this is only going to become more important. Britain faces considerable economic uncertainty and there is a risk of further austerity cuts. If this is the case, then social housing tenants are likely to bear the full brunt of it meaning financial pressures on low-income households are only likely to increase. This makes the work uh, housing associations are doing with credit unions all the more crucial. And it also makes the findings of Joseph Roundtree's research essential reading. So today we'll be examining some case studies from the report and picking out what housing professionals should learn from the findings. Speaking this afternoon, we have Yvette Hartree, research fellow at the University of Bristol, We've got Elaine Wilkinson, Money Management Advisor at Southway Housing, and we've got Scott McGiven, Kinvan rather, Financial Inclusion Manager at Affinity Sutton. We will hear presentations from each of them, followed by a question and answer session. Please feel free to pose questions to our panelists throughout, however. You'll notice that in the bottom right-hand corner, there's a sort of MSN-style chat box, and if you pose questions through that, our panelists will do their best to answer them throughout, uh, well, as soon as they finish their presentations. Also, please do tweet uh, throughout the event uh, using the hashtag JRF Affordable Credit. That's hashtag JRF Affordable Credit. So, first up, we've got uh, Yvette Hartree, Hartree to talk us through innovation in delivering affordable credit. So, I'm going to pass you over to Yvette. Hi, hi there everyone. Uh, I'm going to be talking about some of the key research findings from the research that we did for JRF and we looked at the activities of social housing providers in delivering affordable credit schemes. And in particular, I'm going to focus on what we learned about what works. Very briefly to give you an idea of what we did, the main element of the research involved 13 case studies. And 11 of these were in the UK, and they included Southway Housing and Affinity Sutton, amongst others. And we had two Australian community housing provider schemes because we wanted to try and see what international examples there were. And to provide a wider context to this case study research, we also conducted a review of evaluations of affordable credit schemes in both the UK and abroad. So in terms of the findings, I think a key point to get across is that the design of schemes is absolutely key to their success. So in terms of what the scheme is aiming to achieve, in our case studies there were three key motivations. The first was to provide an alternative source of credit that was affordable and this arose from concerns about tenants using high cost credit. A second motivation was to improve more generally tenants' financial capability and well-being and this was often linked to schemes that encourage saving. And another underlying motivation, very current, was to reduce rent arrears being brought about by welfare reform. So except for the two Australian case studies we looked at, which were delivered completely in-house, the UK schemes all included a delivery partner, and in most cases this was a credit union. But within this general model, the schemes varied in terms of who they targeted, who carried the financial risk, and the level of involvement of housing associations in administering loans. So in terms of the design of schemes and who they targeted, some of our case study schemes were open to all tenants, subject to affordability checks. Others restricted access to what we called good tenants, and they had 
unblemished tenancies and excluded tenants with any rent arrears. But we also had case studies that specifically targeted excluded tenants, and this was those who had poor credit histories or rent arrears. So whilst affordability checks were still conducted, having arrears or a poor credit history was not necessarily a barrier to applying for a loan. Some schemes also attached other conditions to accessing loans, and the most common one here was a requirement for tenants to save regularly with the credit union, either before the loan was made or during the lifetime of the loan. Other conditions focused on encouraging tenants to make positive behaviour changes, such as having an up-to-date gas safety check or engaging in debt advice teams. The potential outcomes of getting the design wrong, a low take-up and possibly higher level of defaults when lending to riskier clients with poor credit histories or rent arrears. And we found that where schemes encountered problems or were not meeting tenants' needs, the designs were often changed, indicating that housing associations and their partners need to be flexible in their design and implementation. For sticking with scheme design and what works, there were two key points that emerged from risk. One was that schemes that require tenants to save first as a condition of applying for a loan were not very popular. This was either because tenants said they could not afford to save or because they were not prepared to wait several weeks for a loan whilst they built up a savings record. And the other key point was schemes that are able to offer a quick loan approval service are viewed positively by tenants. And this is particularly important if schemes are aiming to replace use of high cost credit, such as payday payday lenders who provide very quick turnaround with their loans. But I just want to say a bit about the wider evidence. When we were looking at evaluation evidence in other countries, we found in Australia and Europe examples of schemes that were not designed to directly compete with payday lenders and had more lengthy application processes. So a key feature of these schemes was that the loan application provided an opportunity for a face-to-face -face conversation with applicants. And this was seen as acting as a teachable moment to review budgeting, explain loan repayment responsibilities, and improve financial capability. So there's a tension here that on the one hand, having a face-to-face -face financial conversation might not meet tenants' needs for a quick loan approval process and may not be suitable for meeting emergency needs but it is a model that could sit well within the delivery of a wider money advice service. And the appropriateness of this will depend on the aims of the scheme. Some key points about working with credit unions. So all of our case study schemes were in partnerships. These were the UK ones, except for one that was partnered with a local building society. And housing associations reported many benefits of partnering with credit unions. This included that they hold the credit license, their expertise, IT systems already in place, and they can also take responsibility for chasing up arrears. So in terms of what works, an already established relationship between the housing association and loan provider did appear to be an important success factor. We found that housing associations can benefit from the expertise of credit unions at the design stage. And here it was important that schemes are meshed with the credit union's way of working as much as possible. And in a few of the case studies, the credit union's view was that the housing association hadn't fully appreciated the way the credit union operated. But these design issues were resolved with discussion and tweaking of the operational model. There were also some issues around capacity, with some credit unions considering that housing associations asked for more than the credit union was able to offer. And some of these difficulties <clears throat> resulted from the disparate sizes of organisations, with housing associations generally having far larger staff and being better resourced than the credit unions were. Where credit unions were asked to deliver services they weren't familiar with, or which were beyond their capacity, this could lead to problems. And again, the ability to compromise and be flexible with scheme design encouraged success. So the key lessons, I mean, they are fairly obvious, but it came quite strongly from the research, were that regular communication and close working between housing association staff and credit union staff did help successful implementation and delivery. 
And this is bearing in mind that some of the schemes were new and experimental and did require trust and tolerance between partners. So good regular communication could help to manage any differences in expectations. Take up and scheme promotion were other key issues that emerged from the research and low take up of schemes was commonly reported by housing associations. So some of the reasons for this were unrealistic expectations by housing associations of take up and some had just been over ambitious with their targets. In some of the case studies, it was apparent that resident surveys to identify potential demand for affordable credit among tenants didn't materialise. So tenants who said they were interested in saving weren't necessarily the same people who were interested in taking out loans. And when there was evidence that tenants were using high-cost credit, it doesn't necessarily mean that they want to stop using high-cost credit. So in terms of scheme eligibility criteria, this could be a barrier to take up and broadly speaking the tighter criteria, the lower the take up will be. And going back to the designer schemes, if they didn't match tenants' needs in terms of the size of loans available or the speed of loan processing or requiring ten tenants to save before they could take out a loan, this could all impact on take up. So related to take up was scheme promotion, and this was a challenge in terms of the time and resources it required to raise tenant awareness and promote schemes. And this is especially in the face of extensive marketing by for-profit lenders. So housing associations carried out a range of direct advertising to tenants, such as newsletters, website promotion, tenant information packs, advertising at community venues, and promotion at forums and events. Staff within housing association teams that had a direct role in delivering the schemes also played a key role in promoting them to tenants through face-to-face -face contact that they had with them. But it also emerged that within housing associations, promoting the schemes to wider staff who come into contact tenant with tenants such as rent officers is also key but all of this can be harder when both properties and staff are dispersed across different sites and dispersed geographically. So the evidence suggests that it does take time to build up a customer base and for word of mouth promotion to develop. So my last slide is just a brief comment on affordable credit fitting in with wider financial inclusion strategies. So of the schemes that we looked at, most were part of a broader financial inclusion or anti-poverty strategy to combat disadvantage among tenants. And in some cases, the affordable credit element was quite a minor part of the overall strategy. Our conclusion from the research was that this is a key strength of affordable credit schemes. So when they sit within a wider strategy and model, it means that tenants on the lowest incomes who were refused a loan because they don't have sufficient disposable income can be referred to other sources of help such as charitable grants, local welfare support schemes and benefits and debt advice. So I've gone through some of the key findings from the research but there is a lot more detail in the research report if you'd like to have a look at that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that Yvette, that was absolutely fascinating. I'm now going to pass you on to, uh, to Elaine Wilkinson is going to talk to us a little bit about her experience as money management advisor at Southway Housing. Elaine, if you could kick off, that would be fantastic. Okay, thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, we developed the, uh, our scheme um, during the summer of 2014. Um, basically, we, we looked at um, other forms of de de developing affordable credit um, we looked at My Home Finance, uh, which was a scheme at the time that was being promoted to housing associations. Um, but we decided in the end to develop our, our own scheme. Um, most of our tenants live in, the sort of in one area of South Manchester, and we work very closely with uh, our local credit union anyway, and have a very good relationship with them. We heavily promote them with our tenants. 
But um, we developed our scheme. Basically, we, we've got the economic climate, like you were saying yourself, Nick, uh, of the uncertain job market, uh, people moving in and out of work, and uh, the benefit changes where people were going to have to probably go quite long periods of time without, without funds. And also withdrawals, uh, withdrawal of the um, social fund. Are my slides not up, Nick? <laughs> Sorry. Um, withdrawal of the social fund and other forms of, uh, of support were disappearing. Um, also, um, we were concerned about the problem, a lot of problem debt with the increased numbers turning to high interest lenders. Um, a lot of the credit union itself was reporting to us that people borrowing from the credit union didn't quite have enough funds and were then going to payday lenders um, to top up uh, those sorts of loans. So we were concerned about that. Um, as, as part of, um, we joined with other housing providers to have, we committed to five poverty pledges, one of which was to uh, improve access to affordable credit. And, and so it was also part of our, our commitment to that, that we, we helped our tenants to get access to um, low interest credit or lower interest credit. And um, we found the credit union, um, people sometimes um, hadn't repaid enough. They got a credit union loan and hadn't yet repaid enough to, uh, to top it up. So there was a shortfall there. And what we decided to develop it for was what we call a home emergency. So we didn't want to just be short of people short of money, but people that had suddenly through no fault of their own uh, needed money for, say, car breakdown uh, and they had to get to work uh, or they got no cooker, that kind of thing. So we designed the scheme. Credit Union was already um, delivering the welfare provision fund and the council were paying them um, an admin fee and that seemed to work really well. So we started to model our scheme on a, on a similar basis. Um, so Southway decided to fund the scheme with uh, giving the credit union uh, capital. We initially gave them uh, £50,000, which was to provide capital to lend out the, the money to tenants and also to uh, pay fees. Um, Southway would do, the, do all the uh, eligibility checks. So people, if they want to apply for one of our loans, which we call Southway Solutions, um, we check that there's no eviction been authorised and there's no antisocial behaviour injunction in place and that they haven't got an overdue gas safety check. Okay. And, um, and then they're given a, a reference number uh, that they take to the credit union. So the credit union basically do all the administration, they process the loans. Uh, and we pay them um, a £30 fee per, per loan. So the product, there's two products. One is Southway Solutions, which is, uh, like I say, for uh, what we call home emergencies. And also, uh, it's good for people setting up home. Part of uh, sustaining tenancies is that people have a cooker, they have some furniture, etc. So um, it's also good for, for new tenants. Basically, they can borrow between 100 and 300 pounds. Now, we decided on that because less than 100 pounds, it isn't worth the, the, the admin fee, the costs don't stack up. And 300 pounds is not really enough to put anybody in serious debt uh, because we do make it um, quite easy for them to borrow. And the repayment periods are between three months and 36 months, so they can vary um, how much interest they pay and or whether the repayments are lower. Um, the APR is 42.6, which, as you know, credit unions can, uh, the law changed and can charge 3% per month. So it's higher than the credit union loan, but what we hope is that people will, after having one of our loans, uh, start borrowing from the credit union at lower interest. Um, and if they take a loan out for over a year, um, we have it where they can migrate to a credit union loan if they've made regular payments for, say, over six months, that they can uh, be migrated over to a credit union loan at 26.8. Um, we don't credit check people for a solutions loan. Um, like I say, we don't see it as the £300 as being enough to put people in serious debt. And one of the important things um, was that they got fast payments. 
uh, and that's one of the reasons why the scheme's been so popular. And they can actually get same-day payments if they have all their uh, ID, um, proof of income, and all their paperwork in order. And if they can get to the credit union by 2 p.m., um, they can often be paid the same day, but certainly by the next day. Uh, and that's been one of the reasons why the scheme has been so successful, that it does actually challenge payday lenders who, as we know, lend very, very quickly, give the money very quickly. Um, the interest um, goes into a development fund. So um, the interest is actually about the same as the, the uh, fees. So the scheme would be self-sustaining, but except that we decided that we would put the interest um, into this development fund to help the credit union, help develop the credit union, or to improve services for our tenants um, in, with regard to, to their money. And we meet with the credit union quarterly to discuss um, people who've defaulted, um, people who are obviously struggling to pay. I mean, we know, uh, often we know a lot of the tenants who are struggling when we have other, our advice services team are often dealing with those same people. So we have quite a, a good understanding sometimes of what they're going through. And in some cases, we, we've, we've written off um, the remainder of, of their loan where we think it's through no fault of their own. Um, we've promoted the scheme. We don't heavily promote it. And in fact, it's... Um, mainly through word of mouth. Um, we do put the odd poster up in our learning hubs, but we don't heavily promote it. We don't see that as being, it doesn't quite sit right with us when we're helping people uh, with debt and other issues that we, we're pushing loans. So um, it's mainly through word of mouth. Um, we have another side to the loan, which is called RAC, which was intended to buy people out of other debt. Um, but what we found with that was that um, it, it, we, we did, we, it was up to £1,000 that we'd, we'd, uh, we'd pay other people's debts off, but uh, most people owed more than that. So we really ended up um, giving them alternative support. Um, and the credit union itself is, is also gives other support for people that are trying to consolidate loans. Um, but it was a good idea at the time, and we hoped that that would be by referral from our advice services team. So just looking at some of the outcomes, um, when we first set it up, we looked at similar schemes, which seemed to be doing about two loans a week. But in the first year, um, we found our scheme was going at double that rate, and we were doing about 15 loans a month. And it's been fairly steady. We've had um, periods like after Christmas and um, early autumn, the run-up to Christmas, when it, we've had periods of, of busier periods. But uh, generally, it's averaged about 15 a month. And the scheme has been really, really successful. We've had a total of 349 uh, borrowed uh, since the scheme was started in October 14, and we've lent 96,000. Out in it, that's been lent out to date. Um, the default rate, we were a bit worried about that when we first set up the scheme. Um, the credit union, our local credit union, actually has, has quite a good rate of default themselves. And um, our default rate's running at about 6%. I mean, we were worried it could be as high as 10%. So it's lower than, than, we, than we thought. Um, and very few people have actually not paid at all. Most people, if they miss payments, get back on track with it soon. And of course, these are people who would be uh, charged a lot of extra fees if they were borrowing from payday lenders. Um, so we don't, obviously don't charge any extra to them for missed payments. They are encouraged to go to the credit union, uh, discuss their problems, and get it put back on track. We've, uh, we had £11,000 has been in the development fund, and we've so far used it to pay for a computer and some uh, promotional software for the credit union, uh, which has, has been very useful to them. Um, so we have £10,000 still in our development funds for other projects, so we're at the moment looking at what we might spend that on. And one of the other outcomes is that many of our borrowers are new credit union members, um, about a third of those who've um, taken out loans are, are new credit union members, and many of those have continued to save and borrow from the credit union. 
um, which is great. Uh, and we've, but we've got some that actually prefer our loans, even though it's higher interest. And um, we've got some people that are on their second or third Southway loan um, because they like the simple process, they like the fast turnaround. Um, so, so that's that's um, been another result of it. And um, from the study feedback, as Yvonne said, the tenants really like the speed of, the, of the, the payout, the ease of the application, and despite the higher APR than credit union loans, they, they really liked our, our, our scheme. And as a result, South Manchester Credit Union, who we partner with, have actually speeded up their own process and, and are now um, paying out loans uh, in two days, which is considerably faster than they were. It was about two weeks at one point. So it's encouraged them to um, to look at their own processes. And one of the other important outcomes was that we discovered that older borrowers um, were not able to get credit union loans and those over 69 because there's life insurance attached to the credit union loan. Um, so anyone over 69 was unable to not only get a credit union loan, but they struggled to get credit elsewhere. Um, so we made it a, a point of policy that we would we would lend to anybody. We would put no age limit uh, on applications. Um, we felt that that was helping uh, our older tenants and in line with our age-friendly uh, strategies. And we've met recently and decided to, we would continue to fund the scheme. But the scheme's been very successful. We work closely with the credit union and um, we're going to continue to uh, uh, deliver it in the near future. Um, and the only capital required has been to cover uh, the fees um, paid to the credit union, which um, are, are about £10,000 a year. So. Um, yeah, we've been very, very happy with the way the schemes worked, and it's just been received uh, very positively. <laughs> All right, Nick, I'll pass back to you, Nick. Is there Wonderful. any questions? Thanks very much, Elaine. I think we'll do questions uh, in a few minutes. Um, but first of all, I'm going to um, hand over to Scott Munkin, um, Financial Inclusion Manager at Affinity Sutton, to hear a bit about his personal experiences uh, there. Uh, over to you, Scott. Thanks, Nick. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can uh, can hear me loud and clear. Now, I've got to try and get the technology to work at the same time, so hopefully you can see a change of slides um, going on now. So what I'm going to focus on is four key areas uh, to talk about. Financial inclusion at Affinity Sutton, um, our own credit union. Uh, why did we not go down that route? Uh, partnership working, some of the pros and cons we've found uh, with working with credit unions and also with uh, PFP, another affordable loan provider we're using, and some of the promotional challenges. So hopefully I'll get through um, the slides in about eight minutes or so, and then we can have uh, open to questions. So you'll see everywhere uh, our Money Matters um, logo. That's because one of the things that we changed um, early on when we started talking about financial inclusion, it means a lot to probably a lot of people who are on um, this call, but when you uh, go out to residence, it, it doesn't mean that much. But when you start talking about money, um, it does. And our financial inclusion program is really clear. We have a national banking offer. We give access to uh, money guidance and advice through um, agencies. Um, the affordable loans that we'll talk a bit, uh, bit more about providing financial education um, and resilience, and we have a support fund um, as well. On this slide, you'll also see some of the um, stats that through Affinity Sutton we've done last year. So um, our money guidance team supported 724 individuals, um, and we've had over 1,000 affordable loans through both the PFP and our credit union um, partners with 1,600 referred um, into debt um, over the year. So um, for a, a very small team, which we are, um, we try and um, support a fair number of residents. So one of the questions I was posed with was, um, we considered setting up our own debt union, um, and why didn't we go down it? Um, well, I'm sure there's uh, a few people on this call who have been through um, 
setting up credit unions. I know I've been involved in, in two. And the initial cost that you need is, is prohibitive. I mean, um, from my experience, you're going to need at least £500,000 um, to set one up. And also you're going to need a team that's going to be able to manage the um, ongoing costs um, and, and to manage the credit union um, as a banking institution. Uh, there's also regulation. Um, now, at the time when we were looking at it, it was um, FSA um, were the regulator, and now that's um, the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority. Um, and that that full registration um, is a lot of work to do um, in the first instance um, and going through it. But also, we we looked at um, how many how many would ever join the credit union. So we have 57,000 properties across the country. Uh, house uh, 160,000 people. So that was the maximum reach um, that we could ever did. That's with everybody joining. And one thing you'll see later on, not everybody joins um, the credit mu union as much as I'd like them uh, to join the credit union. Um, and there was also fundamentally something that changed um, back when we were looking at it. Um, the, the law changed um, so the, the existing credit unions could widen their common bonds. And we certainly saw this um, as an opportunity to to tie up with some a credit union who was as like minded as ourselves and wanted to to push and promote things, um, and we'll talk a bit more uh, about the the experience um, with engagement towards the end um, and some of the things that we've we've put on uh, put on to help um, residents and try and get them in touch uh, with what we're doing. We also had a conversation um, about. Um, certainly before we um, chose uh, Leeds Credit Union as our partner um, for the national offer, is um, would, would that be a problem if, if it was called Leeds? Or um, we're not going to have a in every area. How, how would that affect? And one thing we found um, over time is more of our residents are comfortable um, with using the telephone, and we're certainly getting more um, online and more online applications as time goes through as well. Um, but they, they do like um, the ability to be in touch on the telephone with the credit union. So some of the, the, the pros and, and cons of, of working in partnership, and I'm sure some of the things I say won't be new um, to people, but getting the right partner um, is really, really important. And we spent a long time, uh, we went through a whole tender process um, to appoint uh, Leeds Credit Union. Um, and one of the things that that came from that is to make sure that we had clear um, goals and objectives for, for what we wanted to achieve, but also to make sure that those objectives were, were jointly um, tied up and, and the ambitions uh, were, were very aligned with going forward. Um, one of the things we, we like to see is, is a willingness of, of new ways of working. And things now we had lots of um, off-the-shelf products. Um, by partnering with uh, Leeds Credit Union, um, but at the same time we, we wanted to see what we could tailor um, and co-develop. And that's one of the things that we've actually been doing um, lots of over time. We certainly saw um, the rise of, of payday lending, certainly through our, our younger residents, um, and one of the things we've looked to see how we could um, do that type of style of, of immediate loan. Um, we're, we've been developing that for a while, and hopefully we'll have something um, to launch very soon, um, but also investing time um, in the partnership. This is this is at all levels um, in the partnership. So uh, the chief executives of both organisations have met, um, know where where the journey is, um, and at the same time we we both understand the strengths and weaknesses um, of the businesses, um, and that's really important um, to see. One thing we, um, we've done recently, because both our partnerships with PFP and with the credit union have been going for three years, um, but actually going back and reviewing what's happened over that period of time as well. Um, we certainly um, couldn't believe when we did a three-year review the journey that we've been along, not only as partners but as organisations. And there's constant changes in, in policies that we're trying to react to, but also the businesses are changing uh, as well and the offers that are out there for, for clients. We also found out uh, that to drive the partnership, having weekly catch-ups um, has been a real, um, I suppose, a real way of, uh, with Leeds being based in Leeds and um, 
the majority of uh, my team based in in London and Manchester. Um, it's not easy to to meet face to face, but we've utilised technology. We've done teleconferencing. We've done video conferencing. Um, but the one thing to do, you can only do those when you've got the relationship built up. So I'd say make sure you get the relationship um, joined up um, and working together um, very early on. Some of the cons that um, we've noted down over time is, is there's no local office for the majority of our residents. Um, but actually, as, as a housing associate, we've also drawn away from having um, local estate offices. So it's been something that's gone through from, from all of our um, services to residents that it, it's a telephone-based or what will be potentially an online-based um, offering. So that was a real con that we thought would be there an issue, but we've seen that over time it's not um, been one of the things that have caused any problem. Also, there is, uh, can be cultural differences between the businesses. Housing associations such as Affinity Sutton is um, very large. We're driven by um, performance indicators. Um, and one of the things is understanding, uh, getting our partners to understand how important that is. And one of the things we've worked on um, very closely is having regular statistical information coming back um, that shows um, the numbers of the, the partnership, how many residents are joining up, how many loans are taken out, how much savings is um, is happening. Um, and that produces a demand um, within the partnership to make sure um, that that's there. One of the things we, we've also done is we have a mystery shopping program. Um, we have residents who are trained up as performance auditors and they have um, called the credit union asking them for uh, whether it's loans or savings or options, and that has then been fed back. Now, that could have been seen as something very negative, um, but it's actually been really um, a great way of actually looking at here's some areas of improvement. How can we support that improvement um, and make sure we go forward? Uh, also, in terms of the other information that comes back on a regular basis, case studies, um, how have individuals been supported? Um, and certainly when we then go and talk to our, our internal funders, our boards, um, those stories um, bring, bring alive um, what we're trying to do. Promotional challenges. Yeah, this is something that I think we'll all um, find a challenge. I think there was certainly in the report, um, the Joseph Roundtree report that's been, been launched, it shows one of our aspiration was to um, achieve um, a thousand loans. Um, now we've actually achieved um, 374 um, in the initial periods of it. So there was aspirational targets, and, and what we've achieved has been a lot lower, I suppose, than what the aspirations um, were. But I think that that also goes to show that it wasn't right in setting up our own credit union. It was right to partner um, with uh, partnerships. So how do, how do we pr promote? What different ways can you promote? Well, you see, uh, hopefully on the slides, it shows this front line is using um, those staff who speak on a day-to-day -day base residence, um, making sure they're informed of what's going on and they can refer really simply and easily. You'll see um, our Money Matters pig sitting down on the left-hand side there. Um, all of our uh, housing teams have um, iPads and they can click on that icon and it will take you to a direct referral page. Um, so making that very easy for when they're speaking to someone um, to refer. But we also had a great um, initial success with text messaging, and text messaging particularly for about um, loans through the credit union. Um, and that was producing a, a click-through rate of about 3%. Um, comparing that with um, flyering, um, which again, I'm sure we've all done flyering, um, a much, much lower um, response rate. Um, and actually no real take up um, um, through flying, flying on a, unless you do it on a regular basis. Um, but then we don't want things um, falling through our letterboxes continuously. So we, we've actually changed something in the last um, year and we're now actually doing um, proactive outgoing calls um, through our money guidance team. And we, we started this off with our under 25s. Um, new residents who were coming on board because we were seeing we were getting concerned about some of the, the arrears that were for, for younger residents. 
Um, now what we're finding is um, through those outgoing calls, we're having a 50% engagement rate um, with those residents. And actually, um, that can go higher if you get more skilled people um, on, on the phone. So my question to everybody um, sitting on the call now is, is what, what would you rather do um, if you don't know that? I know one of the things we're going to um, focus on is, is outgoing calls um, to our residents. And also a different way of marketing, if, if any of you get any time at, uh, after this uh, webinar, there is a link down the bottom to our Stash the Cash game, um, which is, is questions about money um, and trying to make money a little bit more um, fun, but, but also with um, some support um, and engagement at the end. Thanks, everybody. Nick, I go back to you. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that, Scott, and thank you to all our panellists for their presentations. They were fantastic. I'm now going to um, pose a couple of questions to you all uh, and try and put you through your motions a little bit. Um, my first one is a little bit general, um, and I'd imagine that quite a few, um, quite a few uh, of, of our listeners right now will be working at associations that are experiencing um, cost saving um, sort of measures. Um, because of the uh, because of the rent cut and because of all of the other um, squeezes that associations are experiencing, and my question is, you know, how how important is it that uh, landlords continue to invest resources into dealing with, uh, you know, he helping tenants to access genuinely affordable credit and trying to move them away from um, higher cost credit? Um, perhaps uh, perhaps Yvette, you could you could have a first stab at answering that question. Sorry, Nick. Could you repeat that? I was just doing. Uh, I was trying. I was writing a reply to one of the That's questions. Fine. What, what, um, you know, how important is it that housing associations continue to invest resources um, into helping tenants access uh, a genuinely affordable credit, given they're under enormous amount of pressure to reduce their costs right now? I think it's important, um, but in terms of my final slide, I think there has to be this wider context um, that many housing associations are delivering it within, which is the wider money advice. And something that came across quite clearly was that a lot of tenants, if they apply, are refused a loan because of affordability checks. So it's the issue that an affordable loan isn't appropriate for all tenants because they can't afford to repay it. So I think it's investing in the wider context where promotion of affordable credit is happens alongside wider benefit, you know, income maximisation support, which I'm sure is being done. So my own personal view is that I don't think resources should be all encompassing on in, in promoting, in developing affordable credit schemes, because that's not going to meet the needs of the lowest income tenants who wouldn't be awarded one anyway. Okay. I mean, Elaine, where, where, where do you stand on that? Um, well, we obviously make it quite easy for people to borrow, and it's about proving themselves that, you know, if they pay back, that they will get another loan. Um, and, you know, quite a few people um, are good payers because they're trying to protect their credit with the credit union themselves because some of them are credit union borrowers as well. Um, so that they, they you know, are good payers and they know also that, you know, if they do miss payments or whatever, that they can um, get back on track by discussing it with the credit union. Um, I mean, we're, we're, we're happy to, you know, make it fairly easy. If, if um, there are people who can't get a loan, we, we have a very, uh, quite a large advice services team uh, who are there to help with, uh, I help with budgeting, obviously, my colleagues help with benefit issues, um, and we have our, our own debt advisor in-house. So, uh, w you know, we're able to give quite a lot of support even to those that um, uh, aren't able to, to get one of, our, one of our loans. But we tend to give, every, we, we tend to give everyone a chance. Uh, and, and like I say, the default rate has been less than, than we thought it would be. Um, the, the credit union um, do are quite, you know, efficient at chasing people up and uh, getting their attachments to benefits through, through DWP um, for some people. 
Scott, um, you mentioned uh, in your presentation that, that, that it's quite sort of cost prohibitive actually setting these, these things up in the first place. I think you mentioned £500,000 as being the, the, the sort of um, outset cost. There must be quite a few of our listeners that don't currently offer um, you know, uh, partnerships with um, uh, sort of affordable credit providers. Uh, to what extent is the room for them to collaborate with other landlords to make this accessible? Yeah, I think there's absolutely plenty of room. Uh, why a, a session like um, today's webinar is, is really important. Um, and certainly my contact details are on the bottom of my slide and more than happy for anybody to um, speak to me afterwards because I think collaboration um, is fundamental. Uh, I spend a lot of my um, working life within housing um, copying what other people are doing, so I have no problem in people asking me um, if they want to copy um, what we do. Um, and going back to the original thing about saving measures, um, I do understand there's lots of um, cost-saving measures going on within housing. We um, have been in challenging times for a while. But I think there's a real, um, for us within the finish, an understanding um, of residents' needs that we all need to borrow money at times. It's just unfortunate that the poorest of us um, tend to pay the higher rates, um, and then money gets sucked away um, from people. So there's a real um, understanding is if, if we don't offer this, residents are still going to get loans. They're just going to pay more for it, which will have a, a more of a negative impact um, on their lives. So I think um, I spend a lot of time talking um, and bringing in our, our, our key directors and exec team to understand um, uh, those, those needs um, on a regular basis. Lovely. We, we've had one question come in over the, uh, the chat facility where um, uh, w w one of our um, listeners has asked, um, whether this is ever a case for offering a loan um, in order to in, in order to actually pay rent. Um, earlier we, we heard a lot about sort of making making this affordable credit usually only available for uh, emergency payments, you know, emergency home things when things are really a problem. Um, I suppose, um, Yvette, where, where do you stand on that? It's a real ethical dilemma. So I think generally the position that the housing association gets put in if you're if people are borrowing to pay the rent was something that housing associations wanted to avoid. But I think in one of our case studies well I, I had people say t from the credit union say to me that people can say they want a loan for something but they might end up using it to pay rent. And in some cases, it might be easier to just give them the loan for that, whether you know it up front or not. Because then the other outcome might be that the tenant gets evicted. So I can't answer it, but it's, it's a big ethical issue. And I think it's, I think if you were going to offer loans to pay rent, you would need a very specific targeted scheme and context in which that would happen with other support and advice for that tenant is just one part of the package for a loan. So it could be the consolidation loans that are used to help pay off all the other debts might be a way of helping a tenant then get back on top of their rent. But I think it's quite a complex scenario to set up. Okay, I mean, Elaine, um, you've, um, what's your experience um, at Southway? Um, I mean, especially in the context of universal credit being on the horizon as well, um, you know, that we're, we're hearing about um, people automatically, systemically being in arrears. Is there a case for using affordable credit to help tenants out of, out of that situation? Um, we, well, they can use it for what they want. Um, like, like Yvette was saying, you know, they sometimes say it's for one thing and it's for something else. I think there has been one instance where we've um, somebody was about to get evicted and they were struggling to get the money that was required together. And um, I think they they had they used some of the loan to to top that up. But we don't and we wouldn't like it. Doesn't sit right, does it, to uh, be lending to people with one hand to pay their to pay their rent. Um, but if they choose to use it that way, then that, that was up to them. But we wouldn't encourage it or encourage our income officers to uh, suggest that. 
um, yeah, we, we, we just don't think it's, it's ethically right, and often it's, it, and often it's inadequate. The, the £300 would be uh, inadequate. We, we would normally give people a bit of leeway on that kind of uh, arrears. Um, it's the higher end arrears where there's, there tends to be problems, uh, and obviously our, our loan scheme wouldn't, uh, wouldn't cover that. Uh, and, and, and you know we, we do refer people for debt relief orders if, 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 if that's necessary, which obviously would cover their arrears as well. I mean, um, we, we heard a lot in all of the presentations about the importance of speed of access um, these loans, um, and that to some extent some credit unions were struggling to compete with the, the, the higher cost providers. Um, Scott, how, how do you go about? Sort of navigating that relationship and ensuring that you're able to um, really provide same day credit. Yeah, it, it is a challenge, and that's one of the things we've been working on um, with these credit unions to see if we could offer um, an almost immediate um, loan um, to residents in certain circumstances. Uh, I think the key thing is, though, to understand that um, credit unions don't offer. Um, initially quick loans um, for, for residents. There's a lot of work that goes in the background to, to support people. Um, and that's one of the key things we, we talk about. It's not just about, oh, here's your money, go and do with it what you want. It's, it's a bit more um, support mechanisms um, for people. With the online services that, that they've got now, the turnaround is a lot quicker, so long as you've got um, uh, information to hand that's required. Um, so I think it's also just making sure that are aware of how long it's going to take um, to gather that information. Um, and if I may, one of the things from, from the previous question about um, using phones to pay off rent arrears, um, for us that's a fundamental no. Um, certainly with our PFP um, partnership, there is always a rent check that is undertaken. And if they are in rent arrears um, as a resident and there is no agreement um, in place, um, to pay that off, we will, their first instances come back to us as a housing association so we can support them in making an agreement before they borrow any more money. So, so again, making sure that we're trying to mitigate the risks um, for it, but we won't um, lend for any of our products to pay off arrears. We want residents to, to talk to us as a housing association and see how we can um, support them um, when they're having difficulties. Yvette, um, what's your position on this speed issue? In your research, how did you how did you um, find credit unions were sort of responding to housing associations, you know, um, pushing to be able to compete with uh, you know high street um, providers? So it comes back to the design of the scheme. So like Elaine's scheme at Southway wants to compete with payday lending, and then having a quick turnaround becomes essential. Um, some of the schemes we looked at were quite, were past schemes, so credit unions weren't, at that time, weren't operating in this model of competing with payday lending and had a more traditional model of expecting uh, new members to save money first before they could access a loan. I think that's generally an older approach. Um, but then in talking about some of these international schemes, so if loans were being used to help people fund education or kind of larger lifestyle career kind of aspirations or to help fund home repairs, things that weren't small essential goods, then those loans did involve this wider financial conversation and support and help. And in those cases, the, the process could take perhaps up to four weeks before someone actually got the money. But the aim of it being a quick loan was not what those schemes were about. Um, so yeah, it, going back to the design, it really depends what, your, what you want your loan scheme to achieve. Okay, fantastic. Um, I've got one point that I'd quite like Scott to expand on, if at all possible. You are talking about how outgoing calls m managed to increase your engagement rate to 50%. Um, that sounded quite impressive, but I, I just wanted to clarify exactly what engagement, what, what constituted engagement, um, what your criteria or metric was for it, and, and why it's working a lot better. Yeah, first, first of all, what you've got to remember is, is 
it's it's quite targeted, so there's, they're quite narrow groups um, of people. Um, certainly, the, the focus has been on um, under 25s. Um, and Shane, in terms of the support that they've given, so the, the initial 50% is just engaging. We're talking to somebody um, to support them, which is, again, from, from flyering and text messaging, just, they're all about the initial engagement um, there. But to put it into a bit more context, um, our money guidance team um, supported 17% uh, um, of under 25s in um, year 14, 15. And then last year, that had risen to 33%. And that's far much more um, engaged support. Um, it can still be signposting to whether it's um, loans or debt, et cetera. But they're actually um, talking to us um, as a resident and, and listening to the guidance that's, that's given to them. Fantastic. Well, look, we're, we're, we're almost at the end of this session, but just before we finish, um, to, to kind of sum up, if I could ask all of our panellists um, one last question, that would be, what would be your, your one single piece of advice that you'd give to uh, an association that was thinking about setting up um, a partnership with a, um, uh, you know, with a provider now? Um, in the current climate, what would be your, your sort of one takeaway that they should they should leave this session with? Maybe start with Elaine. Um, well, what, what I would say is, you know, work closely with them in a way that benefits both of you. You know, the, it has to have something in it for the credit union themselves as well. Uh, that's how we get a, a lot of cooperation between the two of us, which is why the scheme has been so successful, because we both want it to work. Um, and so even if we have to tweak things, um, everybody is, is, is up for that. Um, and it's, it's the close relationship we have with our local credit union and understanding of our tenants and what our tenants really need uh, is, is what's been important uh, in, in really thinking it through, you know, um, to make sure it's going to work properly, that the process is going to work properly, et cetera. Um, and that's why, I mean, we, we, we see ours as being really successful. I mean, we don't want thousands of our tenants to be borrowing. You know, we, we're glad that it's more than we expected, but we, we didn't want hundreds of people all, um, you know, borrowing. Um, it's, it's, it's been at the right level for us. Fantastic. Yvette, um, have any, any last piece of advice um, from your findings? Well, just going back to think, have a really clear idea of what, you, what your scheme's aiming to achieve. And if it's to try and stop people using high-cost credit, that might take you down a certain design and partnership arrangement. If it's to encourage more broader financial capability, resilience that might take you down a different design and model so i think one design will does not necessarily fit a wide range of aims so it's just been having a very clear focus of what your remit is fantastic and same to you scott what should be the, the takeaway for our listeners from this i think uh, echoing what um Yvette said think carefully about um what you want to achieve um I think choose your partner carefully. And finally, I think everyone's made a start on this today. Learn from others. Fantastic. Brilliant. Well, it's a huge thank you for me to all of our panellists. And also a massive thank you to Joseph Roundtree for um, for. Um, we're going to send out an email after the event with a link to this um, so that you can listen to it or share it with your colleagues. Please do do that. Um, you'll also be able to download it from our website along with all of the slides and the PowerPoint presentations. So uh, a huge thank you, and hopefully we'll hear from you all in the near future at our future events. Thanks very much.